так работает. Окей. So today we will speak about uh, current strategies for digital well-being. Um, and this means speaking about the so-called digital self-control tools. Um, so I anticipated this, this lesson so that you can start uh, the assignment two that is actually about prototyping a digital self-control tool already this week, okay? Um, so this is the outline of, of the theoretical lesson. Um, we will we will see an overview of contemporary tools for digital self-control. Then we will speak about um, how digital self-control tools are typically evaluated, especially in the HCI literature. Uh, we will speak about some gaps, some drawbacks of contemporary of this kind of tools. Uh, and then we will try to understand how we can design uh, hopefully better digital self-control tools uh, grounded on some theoretical knowledge, some psychological theory. Um, so, as I said in the first lecture, um, the typical way that uh, researchers but also uh, tech companies like Google and Apple um, had explored uh, for uh, supporting users in achieving digital well-being um, is the usage of digital self-control tools uh, that are uh, external tools like mobile applications, uh, Chrome extensions, web browser extensions uh, that can support users to self-regulate uh, the usage of different devices, services and applications. And uh, to summarize, they typically allow users to uh, track their, their usage patterns, like with, for example, with some uh, productivity dashboards, some statistics, um, and they allow users to define self-imposed interventions, like usage timers, blockers, uh, uh, and so on. So, how many of you already use this kind of, of tools? Uh, okay, some of you already uh, use this, these tools, and what is your experience with this with this kind of tools? Okay, actually, in, in, uh, as, a web, as a app for smartphone, uh, I was tracking initially the usage mm -hmm. and trying to reduce uh, the usage, but ended up that some party uh, was understanding my habits and then uh, uh, suggesting what to reduce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, uh, for browser extensions, uh, I had a very bad experience with uh, YouTube okay. because it was limiting the bandwidth. So, since uh, I use it uh, as a background while working or studying, uh, it turned up that every video was were, were not uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. But okay, uh, definitely for um, the time spent uh, on. Okay. Any other experience with this kind of tools? Okay, so your colleague already mentioned probably uh, one of the main problems of this kind of tools. Um, so the tool suggested him a wrong application uh, based on mainly the screen time, right? Uh, and this is one of the main problems here because Focusing on screen time only is clearly not sufficient to capture all the nuances of the digital well-being of a user, right? So uh, let's see if we can design better tools, but let's start to analyze contemporary tools. Um, as I said before, there is a growing interest uh, in the XCI literature, but also uh, in tech companies. Um, so there exists a lot of uh, digital self-control uh, control tools in the market. Uh, some of these tools, like 
uh, Habit Lab uh, have been developed as a research artifact. Um, so typically researchers uh, develop these tools and then upload these tools on some uh, web stores like the store of Google Chrome. So you can also download and install this kind of, of tools. But these again are uh, research artifacts. And then there are commercial applications. Uh, and this is probably the most popular digital self-control tool that is Forest, uh, in which um, your time spent on a digital service is linked with, with a uh, virtual tree, for example. So if you don't respect th your time limits, your usage timers, um, there is a problem with your virtual tree. Instead, if you uh, respect your usage timers, uh, you can make a forest with many different, many different trees. And again, as I said before, uh, there is a growing interest also in big tech companies uh, about this topic of digital well-being. This is, for example, the Digital Wellbeing Initiative by, by Google. Um, you already know that on your Android smartphones there is this Digital Wellbeing app that is um, a traditional digital self-control tool based on self-monitoring strategies. Um, and also on specific applications you can set up, uh, for example, time limits on, on YouTube in this case, um, or you can disable sounds and uh, vibrations. Uh, on notifications uh, and so on. So there is also a, a growing interest in, in big com uh, tech companies. So um, what are the characteristics of this uh, kind of tools? Um, we will explore them by using this uh, paper that is uh, a review of, um, of digital self-control tools that have been conducted by uh, Ulrich links and, and colleagues. If you need more information, you can uh, freely access the, the paper. Um, basically, they analyzed um, a lot of different tools extracted from uh, um, the web store of Google Chrome, uh, the Apple mobile store, and the Play Store for Android smartphones. Uh, and they identified uh, four main categories of features included in, this, in these tools. Uh, and the most common one is this one, block removal. Uh, we will analyze them in details. Then there is self-tracking, um, goal advancement, and reward and punish. So the most common type of feature uh, in contemporary digital self-control tools is uh, block removal, to block or remove some, some distraction, some part of the interaction between the user and a digital service. Um, for example, um, through this kind of features, um, these tools can enable people to block themselves from using specific applications or websites uh, or a device in general um, by introducing, again, some self-imposed time limits, like here in the figure, some automatic blockers uh, and so on. And this is less common, but they can also remove specific features within a service, like removing some recommendations, for example, um, or we will see an example probably removing the news feed completely of a social network. So examples, usage timers and blockers, whitelist and blacklist to differentiate between uh, good applications and bad applications for the user, of course. Uh, and also friction design. That means introducing something like a time lag, like the, probably the extension that uh, tried your colleague, uh, a time lag or an additional task to make technology usage more, more complex, more difficult, by purpose, of course. So let's see some examples. Um, again, Google Digital Wellbeing, and there is also uh, an application on uh, uh, MacBook and also iPhones, uh, it's called Apple Screen Time, allow users to set up uh, specific usage timers for different uh, applications and, and, and websites, for example. So when a usage timer expires, there is a warning, like a notification, uh, alerting the user that um, the time is, is finished. So here you have an example on YouTube again, and this is an example probably 
taken from Apple screen time, uh, there is this notification that warns about a time limit. So a classical example. This is less common, as I said before. Uh, it's a design friction feature. Um, so introducing some uh, additional task before actually being able to use the digital service. In this case, this kind of application, it probably a Chrome extension, Focusly, uh, blocks access to a website on a blacklist that you can, you can define. Uh, and before accessing the, this uh, website, you are forced to uh, enter exactly uh, the sequence that is reported here. You have to click, to type on the keyboard, uh, matching exactly the, the arrows. There are uh, 46, yes, arrow keys in a specific order. Okay, so this should in some way block you from accessing the website. Uh, I don't know if, it's, if it works, probably uh, many users will uninstall the application after <laughs> But yeah, this is another problem of contemporary digital self-control tools. Uh, other examples? Yes, iOS and Android smartphones, I don't know if you already use this, this feature, uh, have a focus mode feature, for example, to disable notifications. Um, on Pixel smartphones like this one, you can also set up a bedtime mode. I don't know if it's present also on other smartphones. Uh, basically this mode uh, silences your phone uh, and remove the screen color. So if I activate the uh, bedtime mode, my smartphone is in grayscale to reduce attraction, attractivity to your, to your smartphone. Uh, another example, again, less common with respect to usage timers, for example, uh, is removing the uh, destructive features of a given website or application. This is a research artifact, then probably, I think. The news feed, no, or maybe it's a commercial app, I don't remember. The news feed eradicator removes the news feed from Facebook and replaces it with a motivational quote. Um, so you can still use the platform, you can still, for example, search a profile and go to a profile and look at the profile. But the news feed that is typically the m most destructive part of, a, of an application is removed and, uh, and replaced with a motivational quote. And this is something that you can do uh, only with a Chrome extension uh, through which we c you can actually inject some JavaScript to modify the appearance of a website you cannot do this with a mobile application, uh, and we will see more detail on this in the prototyping assignment. Okay, set tracking, that is the other very common feature on this kind of tools. Um, so obviously, besides allowing you to set up some usage timers, some blockers, uh, several tools record and visualize how people use their devices and uh, allow you to check this kind of information through a productivity dashboard, for example, some statistics, some charts, as in the figure here. Um, so they enable users to uh, self-evaluate themselves uh, through a self-monitoring strategy. Um, so I can check my own behavior with technology and decide, for example, to set up a timer uh, if I see that there is some wrong patterns in my behavior. Uh, so I can decide uh, what countermeasures I, uh, to take. Uh, for example, I noticed I was using Instagram too much. Let's set a usage timer. So this is the, the goal of self-tracking. Again, this is a feature that is offered uh, almost by uh, all the digital self-control tools, including digital self-control tools by Google and Apple. So this is, for example, uh, the same uh, productivity dashboard that is present on Apple screen time for smartphones and for uh, computers. So again, I can see my usage for different app categories uh, and so on, my daily average usage uh, and, and so on. Uh, 
other examples of self-tracking tools. This is uh, Rescue Time on the left. It's a, com it's a commercial um, Chrome extension. It also tracks uh, and visualizes the time spent on laptops. Um, and here, right, is another commercial application for smartphones, in this case. Um, in this case, it tracks how long you have, e you have managed not to use your smartphone. So uh, the metrics, the collected metrics depend on the specific application, but again, it's self-tracking, self-monitoring. Now, uh, less common features. Let's start with goal advancement. Uh, only some digital self-control tools uh, include features for um, nudging people, encouraging people towards working on the right task when they actually are using the smartphone. Okay, so it's not about blocking the interaction, it's about suggesting, for example, an alternative behavior. Okay, um, so they may allow users to set up some usage goals uh, and control their progress. Okay, this is um, an example about a goal uh, related to technology usage. I want to use Twitter at most half an hour a day, okay? Uh, but you can also, in, with some tools, uh, specify some goal that are not related to technology usage. Like, for example, here in this case, uh, it's a mobile application that we developed in the context of our search activities. Um, it suggests alternative goals that can override some bad behavior with, with the smartphone, like during a business day in the morning, uh, remember your goal, go for a walk, okay? So it's, uh, con um, it also takes into account the context. Um, every time you open Facebook, for example, during a business day in the morning, this application suggests you, remembers you, your alternative goal. And so this kind of uh, tools may use notifications and reminders also with motivational quotes, motivational sentences to encourage users to meet their goal. Um, okay, other examples uh, about goal advancement. Uh, To-do book uh, replaces Facebook newsfeed with a to-do list. So it, it's similar to the previous one uh, that was included in the other category, but in this case, uh, it also makes use of a to-do list, so some goal that you, you want to achieve instead of scrolling on the Facebook um, newsfeed. Uh, time, right, uh, on the right here, it's a mobile application. Um, yeah, uh, I don't, honestly, I don't remember exactly what this application does, but it's a to-do list which provides continual task reminders if the user leaves the app. So this is more about setting up some goals related to technology use. Uh, and the last category that is, uh, again, less common uh, is reward punishment. Uh, so some tools include features that reward a good behavior or punish a bad behavior, okay? Um, this kind of tools may also use gamification. Um, so like in Forest, the use of a device, application, or website is linked to, to a score. Uh, and you can earn points um, if you respect your self-imposed interventions. Um, and sometimes there may be also the possibility to share the scores and challenges with, with other users. Uh, so they create, uh, they create a community of users uh, that can uh, check uh, scores and, uh, and so on. So again, forest grows virtual trees that may be killed if you don't respect your time limits, for example. Um, and interestingly, there are also some tools that uh, use real world uh, rewards and punishments. Uh, for example, the time was timer here on the left uh, takes money out of your bank account if you spend too much time on Facebook. Uh, and uh, Pavlok lets you administer yourself an electrical shock with, with a bracelet 
if you try to access some website that are in your blacklist, okay? I don't know if it's still on the market. Uh, you, you, can, you can check and if you want, you can, you can buy it. Uh, it's a general purpose application. You can use it for digital well-being, like uh, by setting up some uh, blacklist of websites, but you can also use it for other kind of habits, uh, for example, eating behaviors and, and so on. Okay? So th this was an overview of the main features of contemporary digital self-control tools. I don't know if you have any questions. So um, mostly of reward-oriented uh, uh, applications are with uh, gamification uh, structure? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, reward. exactly. Because uh, rewards are actually, uh, typically are actually points that you can earn. Um, and it's, it's a strategy that is not so common in contemporary digital self-control tools, but uh, we are also trying to exploit this kind of strategy in our own uh, Experiments, and we will see some examples in this, in this lecture. Other questions? Okay, so um, obviously some tools exist as commercial products, um, but there is a growing interest, especially in the XCI uh, community, in developing and testing these uh, digital self-control tools. Um, and we performed uh, recently um, a systematic literature review on digital self-control tools developed in the XCI community. Uh, you have a link here if you want uh, more details. Um, basically, um, we first tried to understand uh, how this kind of uh, contemporary digital self-control tools are currently evaluated uh, in the XCI community. Um, and here are a figure and a table extracted from the, the, the paper that summarize uh, the measures collected in these studies, in these experiments. Um, so for example, uh, the collected measures mainly focus on the usage of the tool. Uh, so uh, researchers collect some, uh, the overall impression of the participants about the, the tool through some uh, questionnaires, for example, at the end of the experiment. Um, they collect some statistics about the usage of these kind of tools um, and also the level of attrition. So uh, if the users are willing to continue to adopt these kind of tools even after the research study. Um, other collected metrics are related to the influence of these tools on technology use. Um, and again, the most common metric is time spent. So typically researchers analyze if digital self-control tools can really influence the time the users spend on a given website, for example, or a mobile application. And then there are other less common metrics um, that analyzes uh, whether these tools can influence some characteristic of the user, uh, like smartphone addiction. We have seen an example of the smartphone addiction scale. Uh, and also the level of stress, uh, the level of focus. So if these tools are able to influence these characteristics. Um, Instead, what about the design of experiments evaluating digital self-control tools? This is a summary um, of the designs and the main characteristics of the studies under analysis in this uh, literature review. Um, as you can see, the most common uh, study design is uh, within subject design. Um, do you know what is a within subject experiment? What is the difference between within subject experiments and between subject experiments? Oh, okay, so this may be useful also in your research activities, especially if you are going to test your artifacts with, with uh, human figures uh, with end users. Uh, so uh, this is the distinction uh, between subject 
a between subject experiment or between groups experiment uh, in this experiment category different people test each condition um, so that each person is only exposed to a single tool interface artifact and so on whatever you want so as you can see let's imagine that we are um, testing a website for example or a user interface we have two websites uh, and we have to decide which website is, is better, which, which we website is uh, most promising. Um, with a between subject experiment, uh, we recruit uh, two different group of participants. The first group will test the first website. The second group uh, will study, will experiment the second website. Okay, so different participants are assigned to different conditions corresponding to a variable. Okay, this can be an entire website, this can be a variation within a website, uh, this can be uh, not a website but uh, another tool related to your research activity uh, and so on. Okay, this is between subject. The alternative is within subject, that is also called repeated measures. Uh, so the same person tests all the conditions. Again, if you have two websites, we recruit just one population uh, and the same population will test both the, the website one and the website two. Okay, so the same participants test uh, all the conditions corresponding to a variable. Okay? And there are obviously pros and cons of both the solutions. Do you have any, any idea about possible pros and cons of this kind of uh, study designs? Yes? Within subject you can have a learning bias. Yeah. But in specific, I was wondering, in between subjects, how do you compare the two measures? Maybe because they are... Yeah, uh, okay, so let's start with the learning bias. Um, yes, there can be learning bias. Um, and this is the reason why typically the tasks here or the, the websites that you are uh, experimenting are counterbalanced, okay? So, for example, the first participants start with website one and then website two, and then the second participant start with website two and then try website one, okay? So if you're going to, um, to carry out a within subject experiment, it's very important that your tasks, your websites are fully counterbalanced between the participants to minimize this bias uh, that is a problem of within subject design. Um, instead for comparing uh, metrics with a between subject design, uh, typically what you have is the same task performed on two different websites and the same collected metrics, okay? So you ask your participants to perform the same task on two different variations of, for example, of the same website so that you can then compare the collected metrics. Okay, so for example, if you are uh, collecting the time spent, uh, the time needed for completing a task with the website one and the website two, uh, then you can compare this metric between the two different interfaces, okay? Yes, this could be another limitation. Uh, obviously, you have to try to, to have uh, comparable samples. So uh, it's, it's obviously something that you need to take into account when planning your recruiting process for, for this kind of, of uh, experiments. Uh, another difference is that obviously uh, you need more participants with a, uh, for a between subject experiment. Uh, and so this is like a, it's more a drawback of, of the uh, between subject uh, design uh, because with a within subject design, you typically need, for example, 10 people, 10, 10 users. Uh, obviously, if you are going to um, conduct a between subject design, uh, you would probably need 20 users, okay? Uh, so 
in general, you need more participants for between subject uh, studies. Okay. So again, um, let's spend some words about uh, experiments in the XCI community testing digital self-control tools. Uh, we found that the average number of participants uh, involved in these experiments is 36. And the most common type of evaluation is a 21-day control field study that follows uh, within subject design. So what does it mean? Uh, the tool is typically deployed on the devices of the participants. Uh, so the researcher uh, prototypes something, uh, asks the user to install this prototype on a smartphone or a, on a computer. And then there is uh, an initial week of baseline that are uh, seven days during which there is this tool on the device of the user. Uh, and this tool is transparent to the participant. So it just silently collect usage data, usage data in background without offering any functionality. And then there are two weeks of intervention. Uh, so 14 days during which uh, participants can use all the functionality of the tool installed in the device. So that then you can compare differences between the intervention and the baseline phase. Um, however, uh, we also uh, found that there are many different problems related to, to evaluation uh, of digital self-control tools. Uh, experiments are typically short, so 20 day, tw 21 days um, is a short duration, especially if we um, think about our own behaviors and our own habits. So changing a behavior is a long-term goal. Uh, so uh, in, in, in this short time period, we cannot assess the long-term effects of digital self-control tools, for example. Another problem uh, is about the within subject design, because experiments rarely include a control group, uh, and there is a prevalence of within subject experiments. So there is this sort of learning bias uh, and there is no control group, so we cannot assess uh, really the effectiveness of, of a tool, of a digital self-control tool in this case. And also experiments rarely include a, a withdrawal phase. Uh, and we define a withdrawal phase as a phase during which uh, the tool is removed, uh, maybe progressively removed. Uh, and without this phase, we cannot know if the usage of a of a digital self-control tool can promote the formation of new habit, of new behavior. Maybe the new behavior is strictly linked to the usage of the tool. Maybe not. Maybe uh, the tool is able to promote the formation of a new habit that would survive also the tool, right? So we cannot know this without including a withdrawal phase in our experiments. And also there is a very strong selection bias um, in recruiting participants for these uh, experiments towards young university students and more generally towards users that already have several devices, uh, so technology savvy users um, that use these devices, for example, for studying or, or working. So we identified this gap uh, that is the need of involving larger population for studying the, the effectiveness of these tools with different kind of people. Um, this is instead an example of a good study design. Uh, it's a study design that has been adopt adopted in, the, in this paper that is um, experimenting two different interventions on, on Facebook. Um, so this study compares uh, two randomly selected groups of participants uh, that have been assigned to two different Facebook interventions, uh, Go Reminders and Remove News Feed. So Go Reminders is um, something about um, the goal advancement feature. Uh, so the user insert a goal and the intervention, the tool, um, sometimes 
uh, remember the goal to the user and remove newsfeed uh, as the name suggests uh, we have seen some examples remove the news feed of Facebook by replacing it with a motivational quote in kind of wrong so two randomly selected groups of participants means uh, a between subjects study and there is also a control group so another group of participants that received received a placebo intervention uh, so the control group turning the Facebook background from light gray to white and this is expected not to have any any impact on users so it's it's the control group and also uh, this study uses surveys and interviews after each phase of the study um, and there is also the withdrawal phase so two weeks during which the tool is removed to see if the new behaviors can can survive um, and there is also a five month follow-up that partially addresses the need for long-term evaluations okay so there is a follow-up study after five months so this can be considered in our opinion uh, as a sort of reference for conducting a good uh, study evaluating this this kind of, of tools any questions okay so let's continue with, um, with the gaps uh, that we identified in the same literature review um, in contemporary digital self-control tools. I listed here four uh, categories, let's call them in this way. Um, the first gap is self the self-monitoring nature. So through contemporary digital self-control tools, people need to figure out for themselves the causes of their problems and possible solutions. So um, there, are there is no external support. Uh, the user needs to understand, first of all, what is the problem, but the problems may be difficult to, to be detected. And also what is a, a suitable countermeasure, like uh, the right threshold for a user timers, for example. The second gap that is partially related to, um, to how contemporary digital self-control tools are evaluated, but it's also um, a characteristic um, of these kind of tools is that these tools are not effective in the long term, by nature probably, um, because they do not promote the formation of new habits. Uh, most of these tools are about blocking interaction, uh, they are not about promoting an alternative behavior. Another gap uh, is that digital self-control tools focus on single devices at a time. So you have your mobile application that works on your smartphone. Uh, but then if I have an intervention on Facebook here, I can easily access Facebook with my computer. We live in a multi-device environment. Um, so this is a, a problem. And also they focus um, almost exclusively on screen time. But as we have seen in the first lecture, um, screen time, it's a metric that you can use, of course, uh, but it is probably not sufficient to capture uh, all the nuances of our digital well-being. And the last gap is the theoretical gap. So we found by analyzing papers about digital self-control tools that these tools and the digital well-being research area uh, are not particularly grounded in HCI and behavioral theories. And this may be a problem and also uh, an explanation of why these tools are not effective in, in the long term. So let's start with, with the first gap. Uh, the majority of contemporary tools are based on self-tracking, as we have seen before, uh, and block removal strategies. So they have a self-monitoring nature. The user um, must understand what are the causes of their problems like selecting which apps uh, to include in the white list and to include in the black list and also the user must understand what is the most appropriate strategy to block this kind of behavior to change this this kind of, of behavior 
uh, unfortunately, obviously, problems can be difficult to identify and also to admit. Um, and this means that digital self-control tools may not match the expectation of the users. Uh, and it is demonstrated that these tools have a high attrition rate. So the user uh, uses these tools for a week, for two weeks, and then simply uh, uninstall the application. Um, overall, this means that digital self-control tools are not effective in the long term by nature. Um, there is this basic contradiction. Uh, some of you already identified this contradiction in the first lecture. It's a technology uh, to block the usage of other technologies. So it's in a way a, a contradiction. Um, and again, um, it's a technology that blocks um, negative behaviors rather than promoting alternative behaviors. And they work in the, in the short term by nature. So when users stop using or use less these kind of tools, uh, the behavior of the users tend to return to previous levels. And there is also a lack of pro proactivity. Um, users must remember to use the tool to self-monitoring uh, the usage of technology um, and control the behavior. So uh, there is the need of a strong motivation uh, from the user side. We also analyzed uh, in the paper um, the effect size of, of the, the evaluated tools. Um, and we discovered that in the short term, there is an effect of, this tool, of these tools, but this effect uh, decreases as long as the user stop using, stop using the tool. Um, and so stemming from uh, this analysis, we started to explore, to design um, alternative tools, hopefully more, more efficient. Uh, and this is an example of a proactive digital self-control tool that we developed in our search activities. Uh, there is also the link um, of the paper if you want uh, more details. Um, so basically, this tool adopts a machine learning algorithm a very basic machine learning algorithm that can, that can uh, work on, on the smartphone uh, to detect uh, smartphone habits. Uh, what is a habit, in your opinion? Something you repeat without thinking Yeah, something that you repeat uh, unconsciously, and in particular, something that is triggered by some contextual cues, okay? So it's a, be uh, a behavior that is repeated unconsciously under stable contextual cues. So stemming from this definition, we developed this very simple algorithm based on association rules that extracts, uh, again, association rules between context, contextual information, and the usage of some applications. Like during a business day, business day in the morning between 10 and 12, you typically use Facebook and Chrome. Okay, this is uh, an habit extracted from, from the smartphone of a uh, participant. Then this application notifies these this habits uh, and allow users to uh, override these, these habits if the user wants. Um, for example, here, if I want to avoid this habit, I click here on the button. Uh, I can reason about a motivation uh, for using this the smartphone in this way, so that I can uh, understand better my, my habit, um, and I can define an alternative intention uh, for, this, for this habit. Uh, so uh, with the same contextual cues, I don't want to use Facebook and Chrome. I just want go to go for a walk, OK? And then um, I can save my intention and the application remember my goal every time the contextual cues happens again. Okay, so in this case, um, oops, I'm using Facebook uh, during a business day in the morning between 10 and 12 a.m. Uh, so the application uh, remembers me my goal. Okay, so it's not about again blocking the interaction. 
uh, it's about uh, defining some intention, some conscious goal uh, to override an unconscious habit. Okay. Okay. And this was um, an example of how we are trying to solve this short-term effectiveness of, of digital self-control tools because this kind of, uh, of new habits should replace the previous one even if I don't use the tool anymore. Okay, the second gap uh, uh, about uh, single device digital self-control tools. So the majority of these tools only take into account the device on which they are installed. So again, a mobile application works on your smartphone, uh, a Google Chrome extension works just on a specific browser on your computer. Um, so you can easily bypass this kind of tools, like for example, by using another browser, for example. Um, unfortunately, our habits with technology are more complex. Uh, we own many, many different devices and each device has its own characteristics. And we often use more than one device at a time. So for example, here now I have my smartphone and my PC. Um, we use the smartphone watching the TV, for example, and so on. So there is the need of uh, understanding how we can design better digital self-control tools that take into account multi-device environments. Um, and we conducted uh, a study uh, also in the case I reported the link to the paper, uh, to explore the, this kind of, of gap. Uh, so we conducted a set of interviews um, with, 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 uh, with people, with end users, to understand how they uh, reason, how they, yes, how they understand the digital well-being topic uh, within a multi-device uh, environment. Uh, and here I reported some quotes uh, extracted from the uh, interviews with, with the participants um, that describes uh, some of uh, the bad habits that users may have in a multi-device uh, environment. For example, uh, I regularly use my laptop to listen to music while I'm working on the desktop computer. Sometimes this is distracting, especially when the music is on YouTube and there is also a video in the background. Um, or this one. Sometimes when I'm on Facebook on my computer, I take my smartphone, I go on Instagram, and then I unconsciously open Facebook too. So I have it open on my smartphone and my PC at the same time. And when this happens, I feel really addicted to social networks. Okay? Um, so I don't know if you already experienced this kind of uh, habits, but they are very common in our opinion. Uh, and in this study, we also asked participants to sketch some ideas about um, possible solutions, uh, possible uh, digital self-control tools in a multi-device environment. Uh, for example, here, this participant highlighted the need of um, integrating data coming from different devices into a single uh, timeline, for example, to better understand uh, how our habits are, are composed. Um, other participants identified uh, adaptable tools that can adapt uh, the same intervention, like a timer, uh, on different devices, uh, considering the different characteristics of, of the devices. Um, and stemming from this study, we try to also design our own digital self-control tool in a multi-device environment. We started by focusing on smartphones and, and computers that are probably the most common devices. Um, and yes, with, with this tool you can set up timers that can adapt differently to, to different devices. Okay. Then there is the problem of screen time. Uh, as we have said before, using time spent uh, as the unique measure for, for the digital well-being uh, may not be the right choice. Um, again, because if I'm using, for example, the smartphone for work, 
then using uh, just the time span metric I I is not sufficient, of course. Um, and also, providing users with an indication of their screen time, uh, like in the productivity dashboards, may also produce negative reactions um, that may increase the uh, attrition uh, against these, these tools. So it's also important to capture uh, the underlying motivations and goals behind a usage session, like reported here in this paper, uh, if you want more details. Uh, but to summarize, it's important also to use subjective metrics, as, as we have seen in the first lecture, like using some questionnaires, and like the smartphone addiction scale or other kind of questionnaires. So it, it, and it's also, there is also the need of considering the context, okay? So if I'm using Facebook uh, here during the lecture, it's probably a problem. If I'm using Facebook uh, on the train when I'm alone, it prob it's probably fine. So we also need to consider context. Okay, the last gap. Any questions? That is probably the, the more interesting with respect to the other gaps is the theoretical gap. Um, so obviously, um, using behavioral change, uh, behavioral change um, theories in designing these tools is, is fundamental to generate long-term results. Unfortunately, uh, a large quantity of papers in the HCI literature especially do not mention any behavioral theory nor construct to motivate the design of, of the included digital self-control tools. And other papers, a small set of papers, use a pick and mix approach. So they mix together different strategies um, from different theories, but this approach is typically not effective because it, mm, this makes it difficult to understand the effects of a particular uh, theory or technique uh, on users' behavior. So there is a huge theoretical gap. Um, and the first paper that tried to uh, understand how contemporary digital self-control tools can be related to existing behavioral theories is this one, again, from Lynx and, and colleague. Um, you have the link here. Um, this paper tried to uh, apply the dual system theory um, to a review of digital self-control tools. Uh, do you know what the dual system theory is? Okay, so um, the dual system theory models um, our behavior as the results of two different systems. Um, so system one control is when our behavior results from habits or is instinctive responses, uh, again, that are triggered by some external uh, contextual cue um, or some internal state uh, with no need for conscious attention. So it's about unconscious habits. For example, I don't know um, when you uh, unconsciously, um, I don't know if you ever experienced this situation. Like nails. Yeah, like exactly. Or when you take your car, you arrive at destination and you don't remember anything about your trip, like driving with autopilot. Okay. So some unconscious habits, some unconscious uh, responses of our brain um, that uh, with no need for conscious attention, okay? Uh, or, for example, when you find yourself, uh, pick up your smartphone during this lecture, for example, and open Instagram unconsciously to check notifications and, and so on. So you have acquired an automatic habit, um, and now you perform it automatically, uh, given the right contextual cues. Um, System two, control, is instead when our behavior is triggered by our goals, our conscious goals, our intentions. Uh, so here is about our conscious working memory. Um, for example, uh, 
uh, if you have a goal to text a friend using Facebook Messenger uh, and you take out your phone to do so exactly. So you have a goal in mind and you use your smartphone to perform this kind of goal. I it's a conscious goal, right? Um, and self-control uh, in general is about using system two to override the automatic uh, system one responses, right? Um, when the two are in conflict. So for example, uh, you might have a goal to not to check the smartphone during this lecture. Um, and in order to do that, uh, you might have to suppress your automatic habit of checking your notifications, for example. Right? Sometimes, obviously, you fail at doing that. Uh, and uh, uh, neuroscientists relate this to what they call the expected value of control which is a cost-benefit analysis of what you might gain from, uh, from, uh, from introducing uh, self-control, from performing self-control. Uh, there are three different components related to the expected value of control. Um, so first of all, um, how much reward you can gain from, from self-control is the first component. Um, so, for example, if I were to pay $1,000 uh, not to check your phone during this lecture, it will be easier for you not to check your smartphone during this lecture, right? Okay. Um, it also depends on um, how confident you are in your own ability to exercise self-control. And this is the expectancy. And finally, it also depends on uh, the delay before you can get the potential reward. So if I tell you, OK, I'm going to pay you $1,000, but I'm going to pay you in 20 years, OK? Uh, it's going to have less impact on your, on your, uh, on your behavior, right? Uh, so it also depends on the delay before you get the potential reward. At the end of the day, uh, these two systems, the automatic system and the conscious system, um, try to activate different possible patterns of behavior. Um, and yes, what went out is sort of the behavior that gets the, the strongest activation. OK? Any questions about the dual system theory? So uh, what can we learn from applying this, this theory to contemporary digital self-control tools? Uh, well, first of all, uh, problematic smartphone use, like mindlessly scrolling social networks at night, for example, is often the result of unconscious habits. Do you agree with this? OK. Um, however, unfortunately, uh, digital self-control tools um, present on, on the market, for example, mainly focus on conscious system too, because they are based on self-monitoring strategies. Uh, but again, uh, avoiding impulses through self-monitoring is, is not easy uh, and requires a strong motivation uh, and also external support. Uh, and that's why probably these kind of tools are not effective in the short term. So, so uh, are effective in the short term, but are not effective in the long term. And it, they, they work only if the user continues to use them. So the question is how we can design better digital self-control tools going beyond uh, pure self-monitoring solutions. Um, and this is a framework that has been proposed by uh, Pinder and colleagues. Um, that tries to um, include some behavioral theories, including the dual system theory, to understand, to allow researchers um, to simplify the application of behavioral theories for designing uh, digital self-control tools. Okay? Um, it's a, con a conceptual model um, and describes how users uh, form and break habits. So again, an habit is a um, consistent repetition of a behavior under stable contextual cues, uh, unconsciously. 
And the repetition of the same behavior under the same contextual cues obviously increases the automaticity of, of this behavior. Um, and this model describes uh, behavior as a construct that is influenced by um, a set of um, contextual cues and behavioral impulses from system one, uh, as well as a set of um, conscious intentions uh, from the system two. Um, and the execution of a behavior is related to three different phases. This is the first phase, the filter phase. So in the filter phase, um, there are a set of external cues, uh, like uh, contextual cues, like the time of the day, uh, I don't know, uh, receiving a notification, uh, and so on. So some cues from, from the context, from the environment, um, and some cues, some internal cues, so some impulses. Um, and these cues are perceived by the user and filtered through a set of conscious and unconscious attention filters. Then there is the second phase that is the prepare phase. And here uh, the cues coming from the first phase are matched to potential responses. So again, um, I may have a unconscious response to some contextual cues and some conscious response related to my goal, to my intention. Uh, so according to the dual system theory, uh, I can have two different kinds of, of responses, system one impulses or system two intentions. And impulses and intentions in, in the last phase, the act phase, are stacked in a potential response stack. So in the act phase, uh, these responses compete to become a single response. Um, and obviously the outcomes of this response uh, influence the previous, the previous uh, phases, okay? So there is this feedback that we can see it here, this feedback that depending on the outcome influence again, obviously the context uh, for the next behavioral cycle. So uh, this kind of filter prepare act phases describe a behavioral cycle uh, and when a given response is repeated multiple times under the same cues, the cycle becomes more automatic again, um, and the response gains uh, importance in the potential response stack. Okay? And this process potentially describes how a new habit is formed in a user. Okay? So there can be some individual behavior that uh, transfers from system one impulses, uh, sorry, it's the contrary from a, a slower intention, a uh, system two response to a faster impulse. Um, this model also can also be used to understand where we can uh, introduce a digital self-control tool, okay? Um, for example, these are all examples that are included in the paper. We can intervene in the filter phase, for example, like by altering the context. So by adding or removing some cues in order to affect which impulses and intentions arise in the potential response stack. So in the paper, there is this example about unhealthy snacking uh, eating behaviors. Um, so it, it, it's not strictly related to the digital well-being context, but we can easily generalize it to our context. Uh, a tool could suggest for altering context to the user to not buy the snacks in the first place or suggest replacing them with a healthy snack we least watching television, okay? So it's about changing the context. Maybe during this lecture, I can take this smartphone and put it in here so that I I'm altering the context to avoid distractions in this case. You can also alter the saliency of this kind of contextual cues. So reduce the saliency of contextual cues for unwanted responses, uh, while also increasing the saliencies of cues for wanted responses, like using some, some uh, cognitive bias modification strategies. For example, with the same unhealthy snacking example, 
a tool could try to reduce attention bias for the snack by giving the user a serious game to pair images of their problematic snack with something they find revolting. So using a serious game to train the user to avoid the snack, for example. And we can obviously do the same in our, in our content. The last example of an intervention in the filter phase is about non-conscious goals. So we can use an obtrusive presentation of cues to activate relevant mental representations um, by using technology that users carry as part of their personal context, like smartphones. Um, something like priming the user with Artific by artificially adding some, some contextual cues in the environment of the user. With the same example, a tool could support the user by displaying the prime of a photo of themselves consuming an alternative wanted snack. For example, in, in the paper there is also the, ex the example of subliminal priming, so displaying some images that cannot be detected consciously, but in theory, this kind of uh, cues should unconsciously uh, encourage the user to avoid a behavior, for example. Interventions in the filter phase, uh, just-in-time reminders, this is more common in digital self-control tools. Uh, so leverage pervasive context-aware technology to provide just-in-time reminders to behave in a particular way, as in the example of that I showed you, uh, showed you before about our application. So with the Hanelty snacking example, a user phone could alert them to the unwanted eating behavior and suggest an alternative, exactly as the application of before. Uh, then train self-control, computer-based training to enhance self-control and make it a system one input. Uh, so training the user um, to improve their self-control capabilities. With the analytics snacking example, a tool could be designed to support the user to train themselves to resist the snack by again using a go no go series game. And finally, interventions in the act phase. Self-monitoring is actually uh, an intervention strategy in the act phase. So using information from self-tracking to form alternative intentions to act, um, it can obviously be helpful to reveal the consequences of uh, bad habits uh, but again we have seen that just using self-monitoring strategies I is problematic um, and the last uh, example here is revalue outcome so providing reward for correct behavior or punishment for incorrect behavior um, again we have seen an example uh, in this in this lecture about digital self-control tools um, that exploit this, this strategy. Okay, and to conclude this set of slides, um, we have tried, we are trying to use this model to develop a new digital self-control tool. Um, and we developed this application that we called uh, Step by Step. Um, here, uh, the, idea, the idea is that instead of focusing on self-monitoring only, um, we explored how to support users to learn how to use technology better. Uh, and the main idea of our approach is, the, uh, again, the importance of learning. So by monitoring the user behavior, uh, the application uh, suggests uh, the definition of a new learning path. Uh, what is a learning path? I, I, is a learning path to improve your, your behavior with a given application. Um, and these paths are composed of, um, are related to an adaptable and variable intervention. Um, and the, the main idea, again, is to progressively reduce the degree of the support of the tool, so the intensity of the intervention, um, based on the achievements of the users. Uh, so until the user acquires um, a sufficient level of independence to sustain the new behavior without the help of the tool. Okay? So 
There is the self-monitoring strategy. Obviously, this application allows users to check some, some statistics. But there is also the just-in-time reminder strategy uh, because the application proactively uh, monitor the behavior of the user and suggest the definition of new learning paths. Um, and then there is the alter context. We will see an example. Uh, this is related to the intervention within a path. Uh, and there is also the train self-control strategy because we are um, supporting users to train their self-control capabilities. So, some screenshots. There is the self-monitor strategy. Then through a conversational uh, assistant, the application uh, signals some bad behavior like this one. I noticed an unusual number of sessions on Facebook. Would you like to reduce its usage? Okay. So the, the user can interact with the tool and can start a learning path. So would you like to use it less or do you need to avoid using it during your activities? I want to use it less. So the application can suggest the right learning path. So let's activate a use for path for Facebook, okay? Um, and when the path is active, uh, the application uh, uses some interventions uh, that are variable. So, um, are divided by levels and there is a gamification approach. So if I'm able to respect my, my goals, the, the intensity of the intervention is progressively reduced, but obviously I can advance in levels, but I can also downgrade to previous level until I'm able to fully satisfy my goals without the help of the tool. And in this case, the learning path is removed because in theory, um, I acquired a new behavior. Um, and so these are the two interventions that are uh, adopted in, in the previous version of this application. So for don't use paths that are uh, learning paths that should allow me to avoid using the smartphone or an application during a given con context, um, the intervention asks users to put an unusual object near the smartphone. Um, it's like a visual cue to make them remember their goal, okay? And to avoid system one habits. So for example, I put my uh, smartwatch here on the smartphone just to remember not to use the, the smartphone during this lecture, for example. And then there are use for uh, paths uh, that use light vibrations, so up to Q, and as long as users use the smartphone or specific apps. So in this case, the learning path is to uh, teach users to use an application for a given amount of time. It's not about not using entirely an application or the smartphone. It's about using the application uh, for a limited uh, time. And there is this gamification approach. So here, for example, uh, are four levels for the first uh, path category. So in the first level, uh, the application asks the user to cover the smartphone with an unusual object. Then in level two, you should put the object next to the phone. Uh, then you should put your object uh, in your field of view. And finally, level four is not using any, any objects. And obviously, you can advance in levels or, or downgrades to, to previous levels. So there is this. Uh, new concept of using this kind of gamification approach to achieve long-term long -term results. Any questions? Okay, this concludes this uh, overview of digital self-control tools. Um, <coughs> and before the break, I would like to um, cover these very brief sets of slides that you need for the second assignment that you can sta start from this week um, that is prototyping for the digital well-being. Um, 
So the goal of the assignment too, I will introduce it in a moment, is about prototyping a digital self-control tool, uh, not a complete tool, maybe you will focus on some specific functionality. Um, so first of all, what is a prototype in your opinion? It can be an experimental device, um, okay. Um, it could be a software that introduces the idea, but it's not a complete description. Exactly. Uh, it can also be, it can be a device, of course, it can be a software. Uh, but the idea is that a prototype is a concrete but partial representation uh, or implementation of a system. Okay, so it, it's not complete by definition. Um, and uh, prototyping in the XCI, in XCI is one of the most powerful tools for design exploration, visualization and testing. So again, designing a new product from the XCI perspective um, is an iterative process that means prototyping something, uh, evaluating it with users, then refine your prototype and so on uh, until you can uh, you can implement your final implementation. Uh, prototype, prototypes in XCI are also typically interactive. So the user can perform some activity with, with your device or, or software or user interface. Okay. Um, so they are a useful tool for generating new ideas and also evaluating new ideas. Again, you can use a prototype in, a, in an experiment um, to test your, your new ideas wi with users in particular. Um, you can use different tools and techniques according to the design stage. Um, so at the beginning, as we will see in the next slide, you typically start with uh, paper prototypes. So with a sheet of paper and a pen, you start prototyping something um, at the end of the design phase, you typically use some tools, you start implementing something with some programming language uh, and so on. So uh, different tools and techniques um, and this also depends on uh, the intended audience, of course. Um, so here I reported uh, the three main categories of, of prototypes. Uh, Typically, we start with paper-based prototypes that are also called uh, low-fidelity prototypes. Then you move to medium-fidelity prototypes that uh, are still in grayscale, but they are developed with some, with some tools, with some visual tools. Obviously, here I'm focusing on uh, user interfaces, but the same concepts apply also to uh, physical devices. Um, and then you have high-fidelity prototypes. Uh, again, that looks like your final implementation, but maybe they are not complete, uh, they have some missing functionality, but they look like the final uh, implementation. Okay, so different information is conveyed, of course. Here you focus on mainly on functionality because you, you don't have any uh, visual details. Here maybe you start focusing on details like colors, sizes, uh, and so on. So how can we prototype something and uh, what tools you can you use in this, in this assignment? So as I said in the first lecture, uh, you can choose. If you want to program something, you can, uh, obviously. Uh, however, if you don't know anything about programming, you can also use some visual tools. Uh, because we can use visual tools because we are speaking about user interfaces. Um, and the suggested tool is Figma. Uh, do you know what Figma is? Okay, I, it's a visual tool for rapid prototyping. Um, I can open it if you want. It's entirely web-based, so you don't have to install anything. It, it's free for students. And it allows you to prototype user interfaces, basically interactive user interfaces. Uh, you cannot see, let me close the slides.
Okay. The internet is terrible. Okay. Um, this is the home page. Um, you can create a new project by clicking here on new design file. And it's, it's very simple and intuitive. Uh, it's a visual programming tool, so you just have to drag and drop your components inside the working area here. Uh, for example, um, I can create a new frame that is uh, the window of your, of your device. I can also select here from, from the uh, right column um, the, a predefined device. Like I want to make a, an interface for iPhone, okay, and this creates uh, a frame that has some predefined uh, characteristics like height and, and width. Um, and here inside the frame, I can create my shapes. So, for example, this is. This can be a button, for example. Inside the button, I can put some, some text, probably. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, here we are. Text. Yes, now I'm not able to do anything. And then you can drag and drop your text inside the button uh, and so on. Um, you can also create multiple uh, screens, multiple windows. For example, now I can create a new frame. Okay, this is the second, for example, screen of your application. Uh, let's put uh, a label inside this secondary frame. You can obviously here customize the, the font size, for example. Okay. This is just to show you the basic functionality of this tool. Then you have some details on the, on the slides. Uh, and then you can also add some interactivity to your prototype. For example, uh, I want to uh, introduce this interaction. If I click on this button, I want to display the second screen, okay? So I can select the, the button, and then here on the right, uh, in the prototype tab, I can add an interaction here, clicking on, on the plus button. So I can say that on tap, my goal is to navigate to a secondary screen, okay? And as you can see now, the button is linked with the second screen, and then I can execute the prototype with the play button here on the top corner. Okay? So I have my iPhone, I have my button, and if I click it, uh, I'm redirected to the second screen, okay? So this is just a very uh, basic introduction to the tool. Obviously, you can also exploit, if I remember correctly, in the, in the home page. Uh, 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 let's go back to the home page. Now here I have my new project, okay? Um, I don't remember where. Yes, in Explore Community, you can also explore different templates that designers uh, upload on the platform, uh, and you can copy a template and start modifying it. So for example, if you are trying to develop a prototype for Facebook on your smartphone or Instagram, you can use this community and you can search here for some Facebook uh, templates uh, like Facebook mobile, I don't know. 
So for example here probably you have a mobile design Facebook template you can get a copy of the template so this creates a copy of the template in your account uh, and then you can modify it uh, by, by for example introducing your digital self-control tool within within this template this template okay so I don't know uh, what are the the characteristics of of this okay it's just a visual uh, a visual template uh, it doesn't have any interaction uh, so I cannot run it but you can add interactions between the different pages or you can explore if there are better probably uh, templates to, to be used but again you don't have to design everything from scratch you can also use these these templates as a starting point from the community okay uh, here you also have some starting points. Uh, this is a tutorial uh, about Figma that is developed within the Figma uh, platform. So you have to get a copy of this tutorial and then you can explore it in your Figma account. Um, okay, and then you have also a video from the XCI course about it's an introduction to Figma, longer than this one. Um, and you can learn, for example, how to implement the scrolling on a, on a mobile application, for example. But again, you, you can probably find this interaction, also the scrolling uh, within a, a template that you can, that you can reuse. Okay? So this is about uh, visual prototype. So if you are going to avoid programming, select Figma or another tool like Figma to develop your interactive, if possible, uh, prototype. Okay. Then, if you want to code something, I suggest you to focus on Chrome extensions, uh, on developing an extension for, for, for the Chrome uh, uh, browser. Uh, because, first of all, as I said before, with Chrome extensions you can easily for example, modify the appearance of an existing website. This is not possible with a mobile application. Um, and so this is the reason why many of the research artifacts in the digital self-control tools field are developed as uh, Google Chrome extensions. I don't know, uh, do you know how to program a, a Chrome extension? Yes. yes. So you can also decide to develop uh, your prototype with another uh, with another tool, with another strategy, you are completely free, but this is probably the easiest way to implement a prototype of a digital self-control tool. So to develop a Chrome extension, you probably need to um, learn something about HTML and JavaScript. I don't know if you are familiar with these technologies. Um, so again, extensions are written with the same web technologies used to create websites. So HTML, uh, CSS for styling and JavaScript for scripting and logic. Um, and a Chrome extension can access two different set of APIs. The traditional JavaScript APIs um, that can be uh, accessed here uh, for the documentation. And also, you, you can also access some additional APIs that are the Chrome APIs, like I don't remember exactly uh, what features you can introduce, but I think it's something about uh, local storage and, and so on. Um, and there are a set of ingredients that uh, should be implemented to run a Chrome extension. So the manifest that is a required file um, it must have a specific file name, manifest.json. Uh, it must be located in the root directory. Uh, and through the manifest, you specify metadata. metadata. Uh, so you define resources used by your, uh, your um, extension. You declare permissions and, and so on. Then you can have the service worker, um, for example, to listen for browser events. Uh, like navigating to a new page, closing a tab, you can intercept these these events and, for example, injecting some JavaScript in in the browser. Um, the service worker can use the Chrome APIs 
but it cannot directly interact with the content of web pages. If you want to directly interact with the content of web pages, you need to use a context script to execute JavaScript in the context uh, of a web page, probably. Uh, you can read and modify the DOM of the page, um, and context scripts can only use a subset of the Chrome APIs, but there are some tricks to to call, for example, uh, a service worker to call uh, some APIs that are not permitted here. Uh, and then there is the pop-up and other pages. So um, you, I don't know if you have already installed some Chrome extensions on your browser, but there is a pop-up that appears when I click on the button of the extension. Uh, and you can also open new pages, new web pages uh, related to the extension by clicking on, on, on the button. And you can have also options. And so you can uh, develop this pop-up and other pages. Um, okay, let's make an ex a very simple example. An hello world of a Chrome extension so you have to first of all create a, a folder let's create a folder on the desktop let's call it uh, i don't know hello world no test extension then um, there is just one mandatory file that is uh, the manifest so inside your folder, you must have, uh, let's open it with Visual Studio Code. Okay. There is just one mandatory file that is manifest dot manifest.json and here you can declare your, your metadata let's copy the metadata from the slide okay no let's increase the font if I can Mm -hmm. the preferences okay let's read the content of the manifest from the slide so you specify the manifest version, it, it's always three, then the name of the extension, uh, the description, uh, and you can also specify some actions, like the default pop-up uh, is opening this hello.html page, and you can also specify an icon for your, for your uh, extension. Then you can download the icon from, from the web, probably. Let's try it. Okay. Let's save the icon. You can obviously use uh, whatever image you want. Uh, desktop. I don't remember the name. Yes, extension.png. And then you can create the hello.html file that is the default pop up that is uh, referenced here. Okay. Um, so let's create another file. So here is a log extension inside the main folder. Uh, I don't remember the name. Hello. Uh, 
And here you can obviously structure your pop-up with HTML and CSS, uh, of course. I don't know. Okay. Um, and then, okay, this is a very simple extension, but how can we, we upload our own extension in our browser? Um, we can load extensions as an unpacked extension, so we don't have to upload the extension on the web store. We can uh, install it locally on our computer. Uh, so we simply have to go on Chrome extensions. You can also reach this page uh, from, from the menu here, from the settings probably. Um, and we have to activate the developer mode so if we activate the developer mode, we can load our own extensions from our computer. So we just have to click here on the load unpack, and then uh, we have to select uh, the folder of our extension. Select. Okay, file. Uh, could not load the image. Let's see why. So here is a low extension. Probably I used the wrong name. Let's. Okay, yes. I was missing an, an S. Let's try again. Okay. So now I have my extension installed in my, in my computer, in my browser. And if I click here on the puzzle piece, I can see my extension here. You see the icon and the name. I can also pin my, my extension so that it appears on, on, the, on the toolbar. And OK, this is the very uh, basic pop-up, just an hello world. But it's, the, it's just to show you, it was just to show you how, we can, how you can um, upload your extension on your on your browser okay and also in this case um, obviously this is not a, a course about uh, developing extensions so if you are already familiar with this strategy you can use it uh, otherwise if you really want to develop a chrome extension um, i also linked a tutorial on how to uh, develop a more complex extension uh, that could be similar to uh, our context. In this case, this extension, uh, it's called focus mode. Uh, it removes some part of, of the interface, like the two menus here. Uh, you can remove them uh, to enable this kind of focus mode. So this is a more complex extension that also modify the appearance of, of a website. Uh, and there is a step-by-step -step tutorial to implement this, this extension. OK? So to conclude my long presentation, um, assignment number two. Um, again, in the next two hours, we will uh, go back to assignment number one. You will have some time to finish your your assignment to set up your very brief presentation and then in the last hour you will present very briefly uh, your results to the class but then you can already start from this week to work on your uh, assignment one uh, assignment two sorry it's already linked on the course website uh, again, as I said before, the goal is to develop as a group, of course, a prototype of a digital self-control tool uh, for the digital service that you identified in the first assignment, if, if you can, okay? Um, there, there, could, there is a problem here, so if you want to develop uh, a Chrome extension and in the first assignment you identified a mobile application, th uh, there could be a problem. Um, you can also change your uh, your service. You can also focus on computers in this in this assignment if you really want to develop uh, a Chrome extension. Um, 
So you can, again, develop a Chrome extension, produce a high fidelity prototype with Figma, or you can use another uh, strategy if you want. If you are a master of mobile development, you can also develop a mobile application if you want, but it's not required. Um, so stemming from the results of the first assignment and your skills, obviously, select a digital will be problem brought by the identified service you want to address with your tool. Again, it's a prototype. We only have three weeks um, and in theory, you should be able to complete this assignment here in class. So just focus on a single problem and on one or two functionality of uh, an hypothetical digital self-control tool. Um, and again, decide if you want to use a Google Chrome extension or a Figma interface. Um, then, within your group, brainstorm different ways to realize your solution and make some, pa some paper prototypes, focusing on a restricted set of functionality. So one or two are sufficient, okay? Um, pick up your best prototype to move forward. You can make a list of pros and cons for each prototype, paper-based prototype, um, and motivate your choice. Um, and finally, step four, translate your paper prototype into a high fidelity prototype, exploiting again the strategy that, that you want. And finally, create a report summarizing what you have done in this, in this assignment. Make sure to include the, the service that you identified from the first assignment and the specific problem that you are trying to address with, with your tool the paper prototypes and the motivation for selecting the given one and also include the high fidelity prototype with some some screenshots and some textual explanation okay that's it then uh, on lesson four you will be asked to present your work to the class again with a very brief presentation without any strict rules for the presentation format. Uh, you can also, you are encouraged to make a small demo of your prototype during the presentation so that we can, we can see your, your work. Okay, any questions about the second assignment? Again, just focus on one or two functionality. You are not expected to develop a very big project uh, so if you want, you can, of course, but okay, I think we can make a break, 20 minutes, and then we will focus on assignment two, assignment one, sorry. <laughs>